Hi everybody, welcome to the midweek message. Uh, this was going to be an outdoor message today, but um, I had to decide against it because it's raining just hard enough that I think I would get my iPad wet if I tried it. So uh, I didn't want to risk uh, ruining it, so I came back to my old spot here in the basement. Um, I'm going to start uh, today with a reading from Genesis, but before I do... Uh, I want to mention something to all of you. Uh, we've been, uh, the leadership of the church has been in all kinds of conversations and um, we're going to be calling around to everyone that we can uh, to ask a few questions about what kind of technology you have, what uh, software you, you might use. Um, we're trying to come up with the best ways for all of us to be in communication with each other and even maybe start some other things going on together um, using technology that's available to us. But first we have to know what you all are up to when it comes to that. So uh, if someone calls you about that, please uh, help them out as best you can. Uh, but I'll start with the reading. It's from uh, the book of Genesis chapter 18 verses uh, 16 through 33 and this is when the three uh, the three men had visited Abraham and they just had the discussion about her having a son and this is right after that as the men are preparing to leave it says when the men got up to leave they set off for Sodom Abraham walked with them to say goodbye then God said, Shall I keep back from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham is going to become a large and strong nation. All the nations of the world are going to find themselves blessed through him. Yes, I've settled on him as the one to train his children and future family to observe God's way of life, lived kindly and generously and fairly so that God can compete, complete in Abraham what he promised him. God continued, the cries of the victims in Sodom and Gomorrah are deafening. The sin of those cities is immense. I'm going to go down to see for myself, see if what they're doing is as bad as it sounds. Then I'll know. The men set out for Sodom, but Abraham stood in God's path, blocking his way. Abraham confronted him. Are you serious? Are you planning on getting rid of the good people right along with the bad? What if there are 50 decent people left in the city? Will you lump the good with the bad and get rid of the lot? Wouldn't you spare the city for the sake of those 50 innocents? I can't believe you'd do that. Kill off the good and the bad alike, as if there were no difference between them. Doesn't the judge of all the earth judge with justice? God said, if I find 50 people, decent people in the city of Sodom, I'll spare the place just for them. Abraham came back, do, do I, a mere mortal, made from a handful of dirt, dare open my mouth again to my master? What if the fifty fall short by five? Would you destroy the city because of those missing five? He said, I won't destroy it if there are forty-five. Abraham spoke up again, what if you only find forty? Neither will I destroy it for forty. He said, Master, don't be irritated with me, but what if only 30 are found? No, I won't do it if I find 30. He pushed on. I know I'm trying your patience, Master, but how about for 20? I won't destroy it for 20. He wouldn't quit. Don't get angry, Master. This is the last time. What if you only come up with 10? For the sake of only 10, I won't destroy the city. When God finished talking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham went home. These are the words of God for the people of God. Okay, Abraham, <laughs> bargaining with God, as if God doesn't understand the situation. He's actually bartering with God, and then he keeps changing the terms of the deal like he's trying to buy a rug or something else. What a weird story this seems at first, uh, or is it really? Let's look at it again. It seems to me this story 
goes right after every one of us. Let's think about it. If you look really deep here, you're going to notice that God is not the one in the story who keeps holding out. In fact, it shows that Abraham is the one who is, seems certain that God won't give him what he asked for. He's convinced he must bargain with God and reason with him about righteous deaths versus unrighteous deaths. As if God doesn't know the difference. And we can also tell by the reading, uh, reading it in context, especially from the later uh, part of the story after what I read, that Abraham is really concerned about Lot because Lot lives there. And Lot is his relative and they're close. And he thinks he's protecting Lot as part of this too, I'm sure. Now notice that God never does reject any of Abraham's requests. He never responds with any sort of negativism or a sense of frustration that, you know, uh, goes at Abraham as if he's going reaching some kind of limit. It's Abraham that keeps talking that way. And the way Abraham barters with God, it seems to me that he's he thinks God is frustrated with him. But God never demonstrates anything like that whatsoever. So, in fact, the more Abraham keeps horse trading, the more God keeps giving in, all the way down from 50 to 10. Now, let's put ourselves in that story. We're praying with God. How often do we do this kind of thing? Don't all of us sometimes think we're cutting deals with God? Don't we all act like we have to bargain with God? Sometimes we'll act like, uh, oh, I'll offer up some good deeds as some kind of leverage, or uh, I'll, I'll make sure I read my Bible more, or I'll throw myself into more prayer or devotion, and uh, I'm convincing God, I think that, that, that I'm using these things as some kind of leverage. Do you ever do that? We throw ourselves into that. Trying to get God to do as we wish. Now, when we're doing it, we don't think of it that way. But a lot of people, I think all of us at one point or another, will do that just the same. And especially in a time of crisis like we're in now. Maybe, Lord, if I... Uh, I pour over my Bibles just enough, or if I hang in there and act just brave enough, then God, you'll come through for me. Well, maybe we pretend to trust God with a strong faith, but the truth may be that deep down inside, we're still anxious and not just a little bit afraid of what's going on. But here's the thing. We never, ever have to cut deals with God. In fact, the bottom line is God has already uh, showed us his whole hand of cards. If you look at Romans uh, 8 or 5, verse 8, let me read it for you exactly. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We've already been given the best possible deal we could get. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. So there's no need to bargain with God. The Father is already madly in love with us and was long before we ever became aware of it. So we can drop the mask and we can stop trying to cut deals. God already knows every, one of, every single one of our motivations. We can simply just go ahead and ask God whatever we want to. Ask for whatever we want. Now, look, there's no guarantees that we're going to get exactly what we ask for. And the thing is, we need to remember that the Father already knows what is exactly the best thing for us. We don't. But nonetheless, and Jesus emphasized this, we can boldly and confidently go before the throne, the throne of God and ask for things knowing that God knows what's best for us. God doesn't need us to buy his affection. We've already got it. And God never, ever wants us or needs us to cut some kind of deal. 
God is not the holdout in the story. We are. And we need to remember that regardless of what we say or do, we are radically and unconditionally loved. And that we can ask for what we need honestly and simply. No strings attached. Let's not ever forget that. Let's pray. Lord, you've already done for us everything way beyond anything we could ask for or even imagine. So remind us of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks a lot. Have a good rest of the week and see you back on Sunday. And be ready for a phone call from somebody.